through Cherry, I have numerous additions. I'm sorry there. We did the agenda obviously fairly early in December, so there was a few things that came through. Um, addition as uh, under 2.1, um, the presentation, Alberta Farmland Trust. There's just an article we've included for information um, for you. I think it was from the Alberta Farmer. Addition under business arising 2.2.1. It's an email from the executive director of the ABP regarding resolution 191008, which was in regards to working with them on resolutions for RMA conference. Under new business, item 2.3.5. Ratification of a support letter regarding uh, Rural Opportunities Fund grant application being made by um, Community Futures and our Economic Development Department for an initiative. So I've included the letter of support which Chairman signed yesterday as well as kind of the background um, for that project. And then under information items 4.1, there's a number of items, a survey on agricultural research that Alberta Ag is conducting, correspondence from the Alberta Farm Safety Center, correspondence from Alberta Farm Animal Care, 2019 insect survey results for Wheatland County, um, Southern Alberta Weed Coordinator 2019 Highlight Report and an Evaluation of Strychnine Baiting Study. So sorry for all those additions, but just unfortunately it's the way it worked out. No worries. Any other additions? Mover, please. As amended. All in questions? All in favor? Carried. Adoption of the October 2nd meeting minutes. Any concerns, corrections? I didn't see any. Move the minutes. As moved, all in favor? Carried. Moving on to. Finish business. <clears throat> yeah, so um, as you remember, um, Rich Smith from ABP um, came and gave us a presentation at our October meeting where a couple things were discussed um, trespassing issues in regards to the arm, on farm protesting and taxation surrounding CFOs. So unfortunately, um, we had contacted Rich and uh, he was unable to get back to us in time for submission to RMA. Um, his uh, fall meetings and their AGM is, I guess, was just he was getting ready for. Um, so, but he did um, forward some comments. So I don't know. Moving forward, if we want to make some submissions, but um, with respect to the armed trespass, they were happy with the additional steps that the government has been taken. But he did uh, suggest that there there could be some changes in regards to um, not having the responsibility lie with the landowner in regards to posting their land, but to um, placing um, responsibility on those people that are entering the land to have permission. <clears throat> the taxation one, um, he did make comments um, in regards to their thoughts being that the basis for um, assessing CFOs could be using capitalized average net income generated by the CFO. Um, I did speak briefly with uh, our assessor about this. He thought it would be a difficult way to go, that there may be other options to look at if there was a thought to change, um, you know, that uh, method of, of assessment. So um, I haven't... Uh, I haven't gone any further than that, so I'm not sure what your wishes are. Um, can touch base with uh, Rich again on this and maybe set up a meeting if you want between him and um, our assessment department or
whatever the wishes of the board are. Questions on that? Tax system for the CFOs? Yeah. <laughs> I would be just concerned that uh, our assessor isn't quite familiar with the industry and uh, has a tendency to maybe be overarching. Lean towards the industry. Industry may not be easiest for them, but uh, government isn't about making it easy. It should be making it easy on business. So, any other comments? Would you guys like to set up a meeting with Edward? Bud? This is a tax for Wheatland County. Specific? I would say no. No, it's it's not. It would be a resolution to make changes to the okay. the way a CFO is taxed because there is issues provincially with, wide. Yeah, <clears throat> because we don't. It's want the only to. way I would support it because if we put a tax on here similar yeah, no, no, to no. what Lethbridge did, that we want to avoid uncompetitive. Right. Yeah. This is just his response to the RMA resolution. Possible RMA resolution. Yeah. We don't. Uh, as Rich pointed out last meeting, he didn't, was it last meeting, two meetings ago? Last meeting. He didn't want to see uh, per head tax like Lethbridge. That's right. And this resolution uh, changing the um, tax assessment on CFOs could avoid those. And if it's coming from the industry, I think we have an opportunity to have uh, a win-win scenario rather than that's how it'll be I don't mind having a non-formal non-binding meeting with the industry of the county and have the players talk and hear their thoughts that would be yeah. good as far as implementing a tax I no. stay away from it until it's mandated yeah idea of uh, net income these are private corporations yeah. they're not gonna do it. yeah that's why I think uh, that's a little much coming from our staff but yeah so our resolution deadline for fall RMA would be September 2nd so we could ask somebody to come into the April meeting and get more information. yeah even I mean something like this I, I don't think it needs to be a board level like I, I don't uh, I think if we have staff and maybe so if somebody wants to sit in and then if we can bring in some industry, other industry experts. In the past, we've always had good if participation by our county uh, operators. They've yeah. come to a few roads and whatnot. Between assessors, feedlot owners, and Alberta Beef, we should be able to come up with something. Why, where is this being driven from? I, I'm trying to remember. The uh, Alberta beef producers. Oh, they're, they must be reacting to. Lethbridge, really, is what I got from the meeting. Maybe I'm wrong. So they're, they're trying to counteract what Lethbridge has done? In this Give scenario. municipalities a different means of truly getting the cost from your feedlot owners. Because, I mean, they do have a completely different effect on, as we know, Right, right. I'm just as I'm, an average farmer. I just, I don't believe I've like heard a lot of pushback from this particular area from the county. No. About our CFOs. I'm just so I'm just trying to to gauge why. So would you rather us just leave it alone until that's somebody sort else? of what I would. That's that would be my. But that is. I like pushing things down the road. I'm sure you do. But you know, it's you know, it's. Um, I don't think like I would like to talk to the like the producers themselves, right? The the, the the operators to get their feedback before I even make any kind of a decision on which way we want to try to go with this, right? So yeah. just so I'd I'd like more uh, information. So would you be against the meeting with the no producers? No. And I'd just make sure we convey to the local feedlots that this isn't a move to do anything. This is working with. 
I'll be asked. But I don't know. I'm up to. I'm. I'm kind of on the. I'm on the fence. I could leave it until somebody else does it. Or. I think it's important to have a meeting with the producers. To let them know where we stand on the taxation. Last I've heard, the county has no desire to tax. No whatsoever. No, no. I think it's important for them to know. I think in their hearing from their counterparts in Lethbridge what it's like. I've had comments from yeah. that we better not be going down that road. I think uh, if they want to talk about it, they got any ideas, it would inform us as a board. The idea, but I think just the producers here and our own staff. We don't need anybody. Over to beef producers. I think it's important to have your industry there. I, I These would, are the industry, these yeah. producers. Yeah. yeah, but your marketing board, I would say, is pretty important. Through the chair, <coughs> through the chair, I agree with Glenn. It's, it's easier. It's a lot easier to be proactive and have them in and talk to them about it and talk, tell them that what you're, because there is questions out there as to whether or not. <laughs> And you don't want to have to react to them coming in in a negative and react to it in a negative fashion. So it's easier if you call them in first yeah. and uh, say, you know, what are your thoughts on it? We have no intention of moving forward unless you guys want us to do something. But it's easier that way than it is to be reactive to some outburst. That I'm just curious if they, if they hear from the Alberta beef producers that it could be coming in the next five years, I think the industry would rather have the opportunity to help mold it. And that's why I think the having beef producers there might be a bonus. Not that I, I'm sure, th I'm sure they do enough uh, communicating with the industry, but uh, I don't think it'd be a bad thing. Questions? I don't have a feedlot other than little farm feedlots, so don't. Feedlots in the county are integral to the agri op ar agricultural. Mm -hmm. Without them, we've, lose, we've lost the market. Yeah. Um, not heard. We well, can I mean, check it out. Moves. But I think Wheatland County is a net importer of grain. A lot. You see them trucks running around. You think you're hauling a lot of grain out. As far as having the board here, if they're just here as on an equal as for information. Yeah, that's all it would be. From our group, that's okay. But for them to come here and give us information, I, I wouldn't bill it that way. If they come and they're asked questions, that would be one thing. But to present them as this is information I would because our producers can go to that board convention and get the same information so this is more our information going to our producers they want to come and sit in the audience I don't have a problem with that but for them to come and be like the guest speaker I would uh, no, I think it'd be a three-way conversation I think if they want to uh, be drawn into it that's one thing but It would be for them to be here to get information from our county on what our wishes are, not for them to come and say what they think the future is. I think that way, if it's that way, there would be much more benefit. But I think our staff, like our staff, have to realize the the income was a bad idea, and oh, for sure, between Alberta beef producers and our industry here like yeah. have forks or Catland or whoever's here yeah yeah through the just to clarify no I it, like when I talked to her sister no he agreed that that would be a difficult way the income way um, to, to do it right so he isn't advocating for any other any changes um, you know one way or the other it's a complicated issue for sure so We can return to this because we do have till September. 
we can think on it and bring it back in April. And if there's no sure. I think if our sense is that industry isn't going to be like I don't think they're lobbying for a change no. so I think the time for engagement would be if the province brings something out then on behalf of our producers we could be advocating but sounds good everybody good with that that's just my thoughts go with Amber's thoughts <laughs> moving we will move down to uh, I think we're into new business because that was the addition <clears throat> uh, ASB disposable uh, equipment disposals um, yeah I think that there is some discussions through budget in regards to our livestock our portable livestock scale um, the thought being that we could potentially dispose of uh, the scale um, as well as the rubber mats and our radio frequency ID tag reader um, they're used by 4-H a couple times through the year um, so the thought would be we would, we would uh, dispose of those items to Cheadle, Rocky Ford and his R4-H clubs for the sum of a dollar um, I did talk to the clubs um, of course they they're, uh, would be happy to, to accept that if we did that so and they would work out the details of where the equipment would be stored and how it would be looked after on their own. Excellent. Questions, concerns, board's wishes? I'd move that the board recommend the disposal of unit number 300 portable livestock scale rubber mats and radio frequency identification tag reader to the Rocky Ford Cheadle and his R4H beef clubs for the sum of one dollar. Questions? I say 50 cents. <laughs> Are you going to throw in 50 cents? So it's 50 cents? I say a 20. <laughs> a penny. Oh, uh, yeah, you all complicated. All in favor? <laughs> Carried. Moving on, ASB plan and policy review. Okay, um, so we do bring the business plan forward each year um, for approval. No um, changes, no major changes um, other than. Uh, the first item under um, goal one uh, did take out the, the partnering with 4-H clubs and supplying the scale and mats. Um, other than that, it's basically the same plan with your cha uh, changes to the years. Um, so nothing earth shattering. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Questions, concerns, board's wishes? That it looked great. Move. Thank you, Tom. Approval. Questions? All in favor? Carried. Moving on. <clears throat> Tony's book, uh, children's book, Dirt to Dinner. Yeah. Um, Did you buy one? No, I thought I would ask her to bring one to the provincial conference to look at, so. Um, Connie's a, uh, and yeah, some of you may know her, she's a ASB member in Cypress County. Um, but yeah, if we, uh, if I can get a copy of the book, maybe we can review it and consider some purchases at that, that time if you she's a feel great. it's worthwhile. Yeah, if we can look at it during the conference, that'd be great. Might be a good idea to look at potentially, I don't know how much, did it say how much they were? I want to read it first. Yeah, have a look at it, but it might be good to have copies in some of the schools. That was kind of the intent of, yeah. of hers anyways. And uh, we go need along to, with our $18 each, I see. Do we need the school's permission to to, to put them books into their <clears throat> we get that before we decide to buy a bunch well we're not going to buy a bunch until I read it and then we'll show the school the book and then they but can decide whether they want it yeah <clears throat> 
better give them to the teachers. Well, I know, <laughs> I know, but yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, I know it's a good idea. You can't get the cart before the horse. Yeah, no, sounds good. Can I have somebody move to accept his correspondence? We'll move. John is moved. Questions? All in favor? Carried. The resolutions, number four. Um, and yeah, just uh, resolutions that will be coming to the conference next week there for your information. Um, I don't know if you, there's anything you want to discuss prior to or, or in the past we've, uh, we've just waited obviously and heard the discussions at the conference before any decisions were made so they're there for your information. Questions on the resolutions? One from Nehill County, crop insurance. I don't even know if they can do that, but. But his thoughts on it? Which one is that? Club Brute is, must be on three or four, I don't know how many. I think it starts on page 49. The chair, that's in regards to denying coverage for yes. tight rotation. It seems to me that's been brought up for by the, before at other conferences. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm not sure if they can or not. It, it, yeah, page uh, 49. Yeah, from an enforcement standpoint, of course, we can't enforce crop rotations, back to back canola rotations. Well, any back to back rotation isn't particularly healthy, but in particular with canola, obviously, if you have club root issues, it um, magnifies the problem and, and leads to resistance, um, new resistance strains. So that's where they're coming um, from with it. For us, from an um, enforcement standpoint, we can only deal with it once it's there, obviously. So I guess this is a means to try to attempt to, to slow down its spread if you do have it. And Neek Hill did find it a year ago, last fall, I think, just uh, just after Rocky View County had made their find as well. So we're pretty much surrounded with it right at the moment. Um, we did um, send away a sample this year that I thought was going to come back positive, and it didn't. I sent it to two labs just to be to be sure. So um, so we're still free, but I think it's a matter of time, unfortunately, before it arrives or it's here and we just don't know about it. Any other? <clears throat> other we can save all the discussion for the resolution session. The cleaning of equipment, I find that one. I've argued that one two years ago when Cypress brought it up because I don't know how you, they're supposed to be doing it anyways and whether it's just education or, I mean, they're not doing it now. <laughs> A little bit of education isn't going to make it. I think it's dated now, isn't it? No, and through the show, yeah, they did come forward and it didn't pass, did it? No, at the at a regional in, level, um, yeah, I don't think it made it past the region even, did it? But anyways, regardless, I, yeah, I, I think that's difficult. I mean, it's to me, it's be careful what you ask for as well. Um, I think farmers have to be cognizant if they're going to ask equipment dealers to do that, that, you know, they're going to have to, to con consider or make sure they're doing that themselves when they're moving around so uh, but I think from what I remember it was a problem that one individual had had with an equipment dealer one specific dealer so I think it was the counselors actually <laughs> yeah. any other issues or questions Can I have somebody move it as information also moved as information yeah you guys are real yeah, I know you're pretty Involved dead out here, guys. Yeah, you're real excited. <laughs> Stay at home if you're I'm really born. disappointed in Ben. He's usually... Well, if you want to debate these resolutions, I've got a couple of issues with them, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't do any good here. Yeah. Uh, so, Tom has moved? Yep. All in favor? Carried. I can just see the... Gratification letter. The constables going down the road and stopping somebody moving machines. So where's your certificate showing me that this has been... Cleaned. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> See? <laughs> you could probably
probably mobile passed wash, around. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody yeah. passed around. So there's my mobile dirt washer. Yeah. yeah. I could swarm that kind of person. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, so an email came this morning with all the additions just yeah, in case Yeah, this isn't my computer, sorry. Saw it. Right. It's real. Oh, I got to talk to It's not there, oh, but. Tech, I can't open these things. I read it. I read it yesterday, so. I have no idea. <laughs> I have it on my phone. I can pull it up on my phone. Mine work. Okay. Any questions with the letter? Everybody have a chance to read it? It's in your emails. Yeah, so through Chair, just a little bit more on this. So um, Patrick had come to me last week in regards to this letter of support for this grant through the Rural Opportunities Fund. Originally, today was the deadline for the grant. So I did do up a letter and talked to the chairman um, who signed it yesterday. They did inform me, though, later in the day yesterday that there is another grant intake apparently in March. Um, so they're going to hit that one. Um, but regardless, um, the letter is signed and was given to to uh, Patrick and Wendy from Wild Rose. Um, and Patrick always uh, also gave me the the um, I guess proposal for this mercantile. Um, he did say he couldn't come today, but if he wanted a presentation to the board at the April meeting, he could come and do that. So. Um, so I think it's it's basically a, it's a goal of uh, the network to showcase the ag value chain in the municipality and connect producers with um, buyers in the the larger Calgary area market. So it's, it's looks like quite a good plan. Um, so I could certainly have him come at the next meeting if you want to discuss it further. I'm not sure if it's it'll be discussed at another meeting before that, but uh, yeah. Questions? What? I, no, have right. I have it here. Here, don't. A hard copy. I think it's an exciting opportunity. Between CF and our own economic development department, they've been doing a lot of work, like with Open Farm Days. They did the uh, pilot project with Alberta Open Farm Days. Um, I think this mercantile is kind of a neat. Uh, extension of that and we have some key producers who are really interested in marketing their businesses doing more education around kind of farm to table that type of thing and there's a real drive for that right now in the market so I think it makes a lot of sense and the CF board is really excited CF has been doing a lot of work for um, agricultural awareness and education agritourism uh, in this whole region so Questions? Can somebody move to ratify that letter? So moved. Thank you, Amber. You guys didn't have any questions. You weren't done reading, were you? My apologies. I'm just trying to get to make sure we're done by ten. Um, well, we got an appointment. I don't want to come back yet. Oh. Uh, any questions on Amber's motion? No. All in favor? Carried. Air's report. There's not a lot to report on in the winter, but I did have a supper meeting with the Minister of Agriculture in end of November. Uh, talked about numerous issues, mainly the relationship with China and how our uh, agriculture goods are being ha hammered there. This was uh, two weeks after they opened it up to pork and beef. And uh, I was informed that there isn't a canola ban. It, there is a ban on two companies, which was very interesting. So I won't relay those two companies, but uh, there are a lot of there is a lot of canola still going to China and through through the states and through a few other things. But uh, that's the sad thing. The two main companies are the main shippers out of Canada, so a lot of the Canadian canola is going south and north to, well, not north, but to south to the states and leaving from. Yeah. But there is, there is movement and uh, just not as much as we'd like. And they're working on 
uh, working with the federal government to allow more rail access at the on the at, at this time. So other than that, uh, Devin Dreeshen didn't say much, but it was a pleasure just to meet the minister, and I think it's important to have those relationships. So questions. I will move my report as questions all in favor Terry Russ's report you can do it there um, okay from my report I believe you would have saw it yesterday as well to your council meetings so just kind of a wrap-up of the season um, regards to numbers with seating um, number of kilometers mowed, sprayed, weed inspections, um, et cetera. Club route, as I had mentioned, 103 club route surveys were done. Um, what else? Our plastic grain bag program for the year with numbers. Um, with the new program we're accepting from other areas, we haven't had any intake yet from other areas, um, which I wasn't really expecting that to take off right away. Um, we did assist Rocky View with renting our roller to them because um, they had a bunch of plastic in storage at Era Canada that they needed to deal with, so we rented them our, our roller so they could, could roll up their excess. Um, something else I do want to make mention of is emergency livestock training that we've uh, kind of taken over um, for the emergency services. We did have a training date in November. Um, it's two days or a day and a half, one classroom, and then half a day with uh, actual handling of livestock. It was relatively poorly intended, unfortunately. Um, but for the the next training, um, which is March 14th and 15th, I think we do. It is full. We have 30 or 35 um, first responders coming to that, and there's. An April one as well that we're just kind of waiting till the end of the month to see what kind of response we have on that along with that there's going to be uh, four newsletters put out um, uh, they will be kind of timely to the season so there'll be a spring one um, will be the first one there will always also be some uh, content on our website and then we want to have a resource meeting um, with people, companies that would be directly involved in a livestock emergency, so trucking companies, um, emergency responders, vets, veterinarians, that sort of thing, um, just to have them have a look at the plan, obviously, you can make any comments, and then we would do a producer meeting after that. Um, Jennifer Woods would come out and do a presentation on the plan, and. Uh, so we haven't set dates for that yet, but um, but it's yeah it's rolling along nicely. So as far as the rest of the report goes, again it's basically just a year-end summary of everything. Um, the environmental program um, content from Melissa, ag conservation program um, report, um, Sarah's activities. Year-end weed report from George on all our activities. So I know it's a lot, um, but it's there for your interest to go through. And then just upcoming um, ag education is on the back page. Ladies livestock lessons coming up first here on Saturday. Cremona ranching opportunities at Olds College. We have Jim Garish grazing workshop. Um, here on the 14th of February, the admin building. Shelter Belt and Eco Buffer Workshop in February. It's also a Saturday, and that's just kind of as a rollout to our, our new funding program for shelter belts in the municipality. Farmer Pesticide Certificate Training the end of February. Um, farmers need to have the certificate to be able to purchase FOS toxin, which they need for grain bin fumigation. So, we had good participation in that last year, uh, and I would expect the same this year. The Working Well workshop, January 17th, and we've had a few of those over the years. And then, as I mentioned, uh, a couple of workshops regarding the emergency livestock planning. Um, probably, I would suspect, be in late February for those. So, 
And I think that's all I have for my report, Mr. Chairman. Questions for us? Uh, question on the <coughs> your seed seed plants. I'm glad to see that. 99 percent is pretty good. My question is, uh, when was the last time when Wendell's was the mobile was done, or does he? Um, to be quite honest, Ben, it's been a number of years. Um, we probably haven't contacted him for a couple of years. We would phone him every year to try to, to track him down, and it would usually be he was cleaning in the States, that he was never doing much out here. So to be quite honest, I don't know what's going on with him. So if you have some... He does a lot outside the area. That was my concern. He's cleaning outside the area and then coming back into this. And does he bring anything back with him, or does he keep not so worried about what he's doing down there? It's what he's... Uh, to be quite honest, they're supposed to notify the municipalities if, uh, when they're coming back in or coming into a municipality. It's just one of those things that's never happened. Um, certainly could follow up with them again and see where he's at. Um, I haven't spoken to him for a while. Um, George has been doing the wheat or the seed cleaning plant inspections, so I'll maybe have him follow up and just see where he's at and how active he is. So. Would that not be good to educate the producers? That they could ask that question if they're hiring them to come in. Just something to put in the county newsletter or something like if you have something come in. Yes, if someone comes in and mobile cleans, it'd be good to educate the producers that you can ask that if it's been certified clean or whatever, right? If that's a concern, more an education on the people here. I don't. The issue is that. I'm sure he does a good job of cleaning. They've cleaned for us over the years. He hasn't for a few years now. But a lot of, like Russell says, a lot of what he's cleaning isn't within Wheatland County. It's mm -hmm. outside. And he's going to clean when he's coming back. That goes back to spreading and that kind of stuff. So I'm sure the producers, if he doesn't do a good job, they won't call him back the second time. So that's not a. I think an issue is to. We inspect our three seed plants, and they all comply. Then he just rolls into town and yeah. takes off again. It's not uh, cricket with them, really. I've not I'm heard not any sure complaints he... from them other than that we don't inspect them, and it's just yeah. not. I'm not sure what he charges. I have no idea where the, his rates are compared to the other plants, but. <clears throat> Through the chair, like he he has been inspected in the past, in the past, um, and like I said, I think yeah, we certainly can follow up with him again. Um, and it's not just the inspection; it's the samples. That's right. Like we need twenty samples from him, so he has to save samples um, as well. And that was always uh, kind of a, a problem as well, just to get those again. So we'll follow up with him again this year and see if we can get back on schedule with him. Because when he when he did do it, like go back, they did uh, come out fairly decent. It wasn't a bad score on, if I remember right. No, there was never any issues. Um, like the equipment he had was was new um, at the time, so it was kind of leading edge from a, a mobile standpoint. The samples, when you're taking, you know, just samples they've saved. Obviously, it's they're, you're likely going to get clean samples, but. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's not necessarily fair to the the portable ones that obviously um, cooperate every year in the inspections. So, so I'll uh, I'll I can provide an update maybe at our next meeting. Any other questions for us on his report? Your uh, total your your plastic bag for this year is too. What has your what's your combined total since we started that program? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> we got to be pushing between twelve and fifteen hundred bags. I expect we're getting up to fifteen hundred probably through the whole yeah, the whole program. Yeah, so the last I had was fourteen hundred and something. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, is that with this or uh, uh, was this added to that fourteen? Um, yeah, that fourteen. I don't know if that, to be quite honest, would have been added. So we could be closer to sixteen. But yeah, I should be better at keeping a running total, but it's just, yeah.
it's we're kind of shut down right now nobody's hauling grain but we do have some bags sitting waiting to be hauled so questions or Tom Scott I'll move. thank you all in favor <laughs> carried moving on correspondence we'll uh, take a look at all the correspondence and move them all together Sorry, this computer is not as nice as mine. Through the chair, maybe if I can just make one other comment. I was going to mention in my report, but I did add to the end of the um, information items regarding Strict 9. Yeah. So there is a study there that was done in Saskatchewan regarding Strict 9 and the effects on non-target organisms. Basically what the study said was that non-target risks are low if baits are introduced to burrows according to label instructions. And risks to small non-target animals like mice associated with bait consumption exist. So they did find obviously mortality with mice in the field from um, consumption of the, the grain. Um, <laughs> it was something interesting to me, the label does say that the burrows are supposed to be covered up um, and they found that that may represent a greater hazard actually than just putting the bait down deep in the holes, which uh, makes sense as the gophers are going to kick it out if it's right, if the hole's covered up. But um, it looks like that Strict 9 is registered though for another five years. Um, so yeah, we'll be starting in to sales again. The price has gone up think another ten dollars or so from last year so we're at cost plus ten percent so I think we'll be at two hundred and eighty eighty eight eighty nine dollars something like that so any uh, sorry no go ahead any uh, anything to share on that test they did at Rocky Ford yeah, that, to be quite honest, the population wasn't as high as they had hoped to get any real good results. Anyway. So, huh? Yeah, so to be quite honest, no, there wasn't anything or shattering that came out of it. Okay. And, but yeah, so it, it, we thought it would be a good site, but apparently the gophers were well under control before we got there. So It was the alkali spot. The gophers don't build in there. <laughs> Other questions on the correspondence? I think you guys are all capable. I'm not going to read them out to you. No questions. I hope. Yeah, it's just one. Uh, do we get many comments here from Rope on the Web that's not up anymore? Or does our producers use that a lot? Or very? Or? I haven't had any comments from producers, to be quite honest, on it. But I know as staff. Um, sure miss the old website um, and even the general store from looking at commodity prices and that sort of thing so but I know there's letters in here um, and resolutions going forwards in regards to it so um, I think it's coming slowly but um, yeah there's things like that general store that certainly lots of producers used so mm -hmm. I'm not the only one then Kind of miss it too. I don't use it that often, but Any other questions, correspondence. I hope to attend the Foothills Forage and Grazing Grazing Workshop here on the 14th. So you guys know how that goes. No questions. Can I have somebody move his information? Harry's moved all the correspondence as information. No questions, concerns. All in favor. Very. Yes, we will. Uh, we have a ten o'clock appointment. Stan, thank you for coming in. Just to note, these are recorded and they can be posted on the county website. I first seen that picture. I thought he's growing thistles. Sounds <laughs> a mic on there, so.
Hi, Stan. Thanks for coming. Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Stan Karskallen. Um, I'm a Calgary lawyer, have been for 48 short years. Um, I'm also the owner of uh, something called White Moose Ranch uh, out at Millerville, um, where we run 700 cow-calf pair and um, struggle away in the cattle industry. I am uh, a member of a small committee that has been focused <coughs> on uh, uh, creating something I'll tell you more about, which is the Alberta Farmland Trust. Um, we're pursuing a project to try to uh, develop a mechanism for the preservation of farmland. So uh, what I propose to do uh, in the 20 to 30 minutes that uh, I've been allocated is tell you uh, of the problem specifically. Uh, I'd like to address the proposed solution, the mechanism for the solution, and then tell you something about uh, Alberta Farmland Trust, which is an incorporated entity uh, under Part 9 of the Corporations Act. So the problem. I think this committee is intimately familiar with the problem, and that is uh, the consumption of farmland for other than agricultural purposes. Um, I have seen statistics to the effect that in Canada, we only have 11% of our total land mass that's available for agriculture. Uh, and of that, uh, there's only 3% that is considered uh, to be uh, class one, class two farmland. So it's a very, very valuable commodity. Of course, uh, our major metropolitan areas in this country are developed right in the center of the best farmland. Here in Alberta, you know, our class one and class two soils are located principally, I'm, I know I'm generalizing, but within 100, 150 miles on either side of Highway 2 between Calgary and Edmonton. And of course, there's some great soils up uh, toward Grand Prairie and uh, further south, um, west of Lethbridge. Um, part of what I'll be speaking to is the proposition that uh, governments should get in to assist in the preservation of farmland and for economic and financial reasons they might do well to start with the class one, class two soils. In other words, not throw it open to everyone. As I drive uh, between Calgary and Edmonton, as I occasionally do, I'm just never uh, ending in my astonishment at the degree of commercialization and industrialization happening up and down that corridor. And of course, as soon as you have commercial and industrial activity along the highway, uh, then there's pressure for country residential development uh, on either side of that for people who want to be able to be close to their work. Um, our good producing soils in this province are under great siege, in my view, uh, from uh, rapid uh, residential development, commercial industrial development, change of use, and uh, um, the land being broken up. As we all know uh, here, uh, farming today requires large tracts of land, undisturbed tracts of land. So the problem is obvious. Um, there needs to be uh, a whole banquet of solutions, in my view, and I'm only speaking to one. Uh, clearly, agricultural policy, governmental policy in this province needs to be guided uh, toward addressing this problem. Um, even the people that I know uh, in the urban setting in Calgary are becoming ever more aware of this as they see the massive urban sprawl that is Calgary uh, on highly productive farmland. Of course, the development tends to keep 
coming to the east and the south and the north from Calgary into the good lands, not into the less productive lands to the west because that's more expensive to develop uh, with sewer and water facilities. And so the consumption of good productive farmland continues. But the urban people see it too. And I think it's uh, high time that people start talking about uh, uh, government policy to assist with this problem. So the solution that I propose to speak to today has to do with the idea of using agricultural conservation easements uh, to protect farmland. I'm sure uh, everyone here is probably familiar with conservation easements, you know basically what they are. Um, as I've done some looking around, I see that uh, Wheatland County has used conservation easements as an instrument uh, to uh, shift density and uh, um, I don't know how much you're using of that currently, but I know that I've read some law, uh, law, law cases uh, that have touched on that. Um, to further elaborate on that, uh, we advocate our little committee, our little self-appointed committee, uh, has um, advocated the development of a policy equivalent to the ecological uh, gift program, which is a federal uh, provincial program that I'll uh, refer to as I speak with you today, uh, that we think needs to be duplicated uh, with by means of an agricultural conservation gift program. Um, incidentally, I was asked by uh, the provincial government to uh, prepare a paper uh, with this proposal. And uh, I sent the government uh, such uh, a document in August of 2018 uh, in which this idea is elaborated on and explained. Um, I'm pleased to say that although that was under the previous provincial administration, that the current administration uh, just a couple of months ago asked Kim Good and I to come up and make a presentation to the uh, um, Agricultural Policy Committee um, all members of which I hope are still employed by our government uh, to explain this idea and uh, we were very encouraged by uh, the uh, reception we received. The paper that I've given to the government, uh, I um, have brought 12 copies of it with me today and I'll leave it here in case uh, people might want to uh, get into it further. Um, let me then uh, address the mechanism um, and the history of the mechanism of a conservation easement. Um, a wonderful man by the name of Neil Harvey, some of you uh, may have known a rancher out in the Jumping Pound area, was the one in, a, in this province who took the bull by the horns and went to his friend Ralph Klein, who at the time was the uh, environment minister in 1995-96, and uh, was able to prevail upon that minister to include in the Environmental uh, Protection Act at the time, inclusion of uh, legislation to equip us to institute conservation easements. Um, at the time, they were only for ecological conservation easements, that is for the conservation of ecologically sensitive or valuable land. Um, it wasn't until 2006 that the Alberta government, uh, in shifting that legislation into what I know as ALSA, which is the Alberta Land Stewardship Act, um, added to the legislation to exp expressly provide for the creation of conservation easements um, for the purpose of preserving ag agricultural land and land used for agriculture, for agricultural purposes. So only since 19, uh, 2006 have we been able to use a conservation easement to protect farmland. 
And let me be very, very clear when I speak of farmland, I appreciate that an ecological conservation easement put in place on lands in the foothills, for example, is preserving uh, those ecologically sensitive lands, but those are lands obviously that are still useful for agriculture. They're preserved for grazing, for livestock rearing. So when I speak of agricultural conservation, I'm talking about conserving pure farmland, uh, like all around here in this county, uh, uh, grain land, forage, production land, tame pasture, um, but land which would otherwise not qualify for an ecological conservation easement. So what is a conservation easement? Um, your lawyer will tell you that a conservation easement is uh, sort of an amphibious legal creature. In part, it's an easement, and in part, it's a restrictive covenant. It's an easement not because the whole world can come on to the land, but it's an easement to the extent that the holder of the easement which must be a qualified organization under the legislation, an organization like Ducks Unlimited or the Nature Conservancy of Canada or SALTS or uh, any one of a number of qualified organizations, including Alberta Farmland Trust that I'll be speaking of. Um, that organization is entitled to come on the land for the purpose of monitoring and ensuring that the conservation easement is being uh, honored. So to that extent, the instrument is an easement. More importantly, though, it's a restrictive covenant. And by that, it mean, I mean it provides for the things that cannot happen on the land any longer. And I'll elaborate on that in a minute. The conservation easement is registered as an instrument right on the title. And it's to stay permanently on the title so that all future owners of that tract of land will be able to see the things that they're not entitled to do. In the paper that I've sent to government, I've addressed uh, the purpose of an agricultural conservation easement, which incidentally is an instrument that's been used for almost a hundred years in the U.S., particularly in the eastern uh, part of the U.S., where much of the thrust has been to preserve the scenic nature, to preserve uh, the uh, availability of open space in a part of the world where otherwise there could be, uh, and there is ever diminishing open space. Um, in my paper, I've advocated keeping a conserv uh, agricultural conservation easement very, very simple. And I'll explain that in, in this way. Um, when you are the owner of fee simple land, it's accurate to think of that as you own a whole bundle of various rights, a whole series of bundles of rights. You have the right to farm it. You have the right to hunt on it. You have the right to pick flowers on it. You have the right to subdivide. You have the right to um, build a commercial building. You have all these rights relating to your ownership of the land. When you grant a conservation easement, you relinquish some of those bundles of rights. So, uh, and the key ones, in my view, is you relinquish the right to subdivide. So you commit that this tract of land will never be subdivided. Number two, you commit that there will never be a change in use of this land. It will remain in agriculture forever, whatever that means. And number three, there will be ordinarily some commitment as to limiting um, the extent of agricultural building. And each conservation easement can be different. But for example, you might not want your quarter section to be converted into a total turkey barn, for example, uh, if the purpose is to preserve uh, the food producting production capability of the land. 
So I advocate keeping it simple. And to me, that's the essence of a, an agricultural conservation easement. No subdivision, no change of use, and perhaps some limitation on agricultural building. Of course, when you donate a conservation easement on your farm and you give up a few of these bundles of rights, you are deemed legally to have disposed of an interest in your land. Therein lies the, lies the problem. Because that triggers a capital gain. Because it's as if you've sold a third of your land. You haven't, you still have your property, and yet uh, legally you have disposed of that, and that triggers a, a tax problem. Um, and that leads me to uh, describe to you uh, something more about the eco-gift program, the ecological gift program, which is a combined program put together uh, by the provincial and federal governments. And in fact, uh, the champion of that uh, was Ted Morton uh, of Alberta when he was the, the Minister of uh, Finance for Alberta. He's really the granddaddy of uh, putting together that program on a province-wide basis. So, number one, if somebody donates an ecological conservation easement, the capital gains tax on that is waived. But, of course, how do you gauge um, the value of the gift? And the answer is that when a conservation easement is granted, um, only certain appraisers, the most qualified uh, uh, appraisers in our society are qualified under CRA rules to grant these appraisals and they appraise the land without a conservation easement on it and with the conservation easement on it. Of course with the conservation easement on it it'll be worth less. If the land's right next door to Calgary, much of the value of that land is attributed to the fact that it can be subdivided and commercialized. And so there may be a loss of up to 50, 60, maybe even 70% of the value of the land would be diminished, would be removed by the grant of a conservation easement. If we go to some land east of here and say, okay, that land can't be subdivided or commercialized in the future, the diminishment in the value uh, might be 20%. Um, the difference is the value of the gift. That's the value of the bundles of rights that you've relinquished when you grant your conservation easement. So, as I say, there's no capital gains on an ecological uh, gift. Um, even better than that, um, the landowner and the qualified organization taking the conservation easement gets certainty. And that's because the Department of Environment certifies that the lands in question are ecologically sensitive land. They certify that the appraisals are valid and acceptable in such a way that the donation can be made and the landowner and the qualified organization don't have to worry for the next four years that the CRA is going to come plunging in and say, we don't agree with your appraisal or we don't agree that those lands qualify as ecologically sensitive, etc. So that is a strong part. and. Um, Agriculturally, we would very much need that same kind of treatment. Uh, when an ecological conservation easement is granted by one of the larger national organizations, such as the Nature Conservancy of Canada, the standard is that the value of the gift, whatever it may be, is compensated to the landowner by a payment of cash as to about one-third of the value of the gift, and the balance is paid by way of a tax receipt. Where does that money come from? Well, it comes from uh, federal and provincial coffers. Uh, so there are large chunks of 
cash made available by the senior levels of government to finance ecological conservation. I don't see that as being particularly likely for agriculture in the foreseeable future in light of the current uh, situation in this country uh, financially for governments. But uh, maybe some other things can be done and something that we've advocated is this. Um, of course, I have not met a farmer yet that really needs a tax receipt. Farmers are as you know better than me, they're land rich and cash poor. So they're not running around hoping that they can get a tax receipt. But one proposal we've made to the province is, okay, we won't ask you for cash, but what we will ask you to do is for an agricultural conservation easement tax receipt, we'd like it to be transferable. And that way a farmer could grant his conservation easement, get his tax receipt, go to town, go to see the dentist, dentists always need tax receipts, and sell it to him. Uh, this is authorized in a number of U.S. states, and uh, uh, the statistics show that uh, um, people are able to get, on, on average, about 85 percent of the value of the tax receipt in cash. And that may sound a little strange, uh, but the reason is because people, uh, dentists, I'm picking on dentists today, dentists would love to have a tax receipt not only because it reduces their taxes, but quite often it will take them down to a lower tax bracket, which then affects all of their income. And so their being able to buy a tax receipt is quite attractive. Um, so we've made that proposal. Um, um, in the hopes that governments might hear us. I'm going to slow down here and uh, see if I can invite some uh, questions. I I'll also mention that uh, in, on, under the EcoGift program, if a person personally owns the land, not, not, not the corporation owns the land, but if a person, individual, owns the land and makes the donation, the tax receipt that is given is the most valuable tax receipt known, and it's the most um, uh, exclusive and unique tax receipt that we have in our en entire Canadian tax system because it's a tax receipt that can be used to reduce actual taxable income as opposed, sorry, it's a tax receipt that can be used to reduce tax payable as opposed to taxable income. As you know, tax receipts would ordinarily allow you to just reduce your income for tax purposes. But the kind of tax receipt that's available in that case allows a person to, uh, if you have to pay $100 in tax, you can use the receipt that you have for $100 to just wipe out the tax. A very valuable instrument um, um, for uh, the ecological side. Um, I know I've pretty well used up my time. So let me tell you that uh, Alberta Farmland Trust has been incorporated. It's uh, uh, under Part 9 of the Companies Act, which is to say it's a company. Um, we are just in the process of getting registered as a, charitable, a charity, uh, authorized then to uh, issue tax receipts. Um, we recognize right now that we're hampered. We really can't do very much. Uh, somebody can give us a, an agricultural conservation easement. They're going to have to pay capital gains on that. But they will get a tax receipt, which can by, a lot, by and large wipe out the tax that's payable so that the donor really gets nothing for his or her donation. Quite unfortunate. We do have two or three... Uh, farm families who have come to us and said, we don't care, we don't look for compensation, but our family's been farming this land forever, and we know how productive it is, we feel threatened by subdivision and commercialization, and we would like to place an easement on our property. And so we're going to go ahead with those and just get started um, with this. 
Of course, uh, our organization will need to be uh, fundraising by some means. We intend to approach uh, the uh, agricultural service sector, service providers, uh, to see if we can get financial support. Of course, we'll have administration. We need to do stewardship so that if we take a conservation easement from someone, we need to be watching that land at least annually to make sure that the conservation easement is honored. So with that, I think I better stop talking. I could talk about this all day, Mr. Chairman, uh, but I'd be very um, open to questions that people may have. Any questions for staff? What would happen if somebody did break that easement, just out of curiosity? Uh, that is a, uh, a problem, and I'm not sure what you mean by break it. I know that... Uh, the Nature Conservancy have told me recently they had a case where they had uh, an old growth forest down near Pincher Creek that had a conservation easement on it and a subsequent owner was ticked about the fact that his land wasn't worth the, the same amount as his neighbors and he resented it and so he cut down the, all the timber, you know, because the Nature Conservancy doesn't have a policeman sitting there day in and day out, and he thought that he could break the conservation easement by doing that, by taking away the ecological value of the land, uh, but that doesn't work. Uh, your question was, what happens? Well, it, it can't be broken. It's permanent. Um, but he, he wasn't fined for disturbing that? Uh, I know that they're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, they have the right to go in and replant, but he may just devastate that again. Um, that is a significant problem. I'm sure they're going to sue him, and I think they have the financial ability to do that because, you know, they're expecting these conservation easements to be honored. The problem with... Uh, um, I know landowners have gone to SALTS and said, we've changed our mind, we want to take that thing off. Well, there would be horrendous uh, tax implications both to SALTS and to the landowner if that were to be the case. And so the rigid rule in this country is uh, they're not, once they're in place, they're not disturbed. Questions? Any other questions? I, through the through the chairs, then is is there requirements then for what land you'll be accepting, or is it just any land that isn't native land? So are you looking at only class one, two, or is it anything that's just not native? We're at a very uh, infant stage right now. Um, we will obviously look at lands that come to us and make sure that they're agriculturally productive and worthwhile lands, and we'll take them. Uh, but of Again, there's no benefit right now to the landowner, no compensation or consideration. Our encouragement to government has been to um, start step by step. And we've said the first step should be, okay, put a program in place in Alberta that covers only the class one, class two soils so that you don't have to worry government about too much expenditure. Uh, but those are the, the soils that are most under threat now uh, by vir virtue of uh, urbanization and commercialization. So h how would you uh, want us to collaborate with you guys to help advocate on behalf? To the I think how can we help you. <laughs> that's a really good question. I uh, would ask you respectfully to whenever you speak with the uh, provincial government at any level to encourage them to put in place uh, a program for agriculture that mirrors the eco-gift program that exists in this country. Now the problem with that of course is that that requires federal cooperation because tax law is uh, uh, governed provincially or federally rather largely. Um, although our Premier tells us that maybe Alberta is going to be taking over the administration of uh, tax policy in the province, and there would be one example of an advantage were he to do that, were that the present government to do that. So the, yes, the help that we would seek from you is advocacy, 
by saying, listen, we need to do something. Here's a program that is proven on the ecological side. We need to mirror that in some way for agriculture. One way uh, ASP boards usually advocate to the provincial government is through resolutions. And I, I think if you were to work with staff or present staff with a resolution asking the provincial government to do this, uh, the board will gladly discuss it and decide whether to present that on behalf of you guys to the next ASB conference, which will be next year because we've missed the deadline for this year. But I think that's what our job is, is to relay these concerns going forward, whether, whether we fully support it or not. I think if we had a resolution to discuss and that, but Amber? I would go so far as to uh, ask ASB to refer this to full council as well. We, a lot of us here wear two hats and sit on our municipal council as well. Um, I think this could be a potentially brilliant program and I would, like as a counselor, it could be a solution to a lot of our strategic planning or strategic thought around development and planning as a municipality because I'm constantly trying to figure out how do we balance like landowner rights, which this answers to because it's voluntary, there's compensation. Those I think are key aspects to it. Mm -hmm. But then it also does protect some of our key farmland, which as a municipal government is one of my top priorities. But I'm constantly trying to figure out how to do that with balancing landowner rights. So this I think could be potentially brilliant and I'd like our council to look at it for fall RMA. Yeah, for sure, and it could be a two-spirited approach. Go yes, through the ASB absolutely. and council, because we've seen that multiple times with straight nine and yep. everything like that. And uh, I don't know if you're super familiar with that process, but it is a really good way to get other municipalities' support through advocacy. And that. It brings the awareness across the province as well, because it brings it to the attention of municipal um, elected officials across the province. So it can be highly effective for both advocacy, but also awareness. Well, thank you very much for that expression of support. I'm very happy to work with Russell and uh, suggest the wording of such a resolution. And uh, uh, yes, thank you. That would be very appreciated. Yeah, no worries, Ben. Go ahead. Yeah, before I would, before I would support that type of resolution, I'd, I'd, I'd like more information on the program. Because I know when we ran the program here back in the 15 years ago, and a couple of our producers took advantage of that to move some tax, some lad credits back and forth. Just the biggest issue to some of them was the, uh, the fact that they were to go into one of these types of programs like they have in the they have in the states was tying up the land for their future generations. There was no way they could get out of if future generations didn't want that. There was no way for them to get out of it. And a couple of that's them the that I know of, of in our I area. think that's the point of it, though. But some of them in my area would have liked something to protect it, but they didn't want to protect it indefinitely. They, and, they wouldn't put <laughs> yeah. their land, and they wouldn't put their land in it because it, it created an issue for the future. You're tying the hands of the future, and they didn't. It would be a very select few who would potentially, I think, take advantage of a program like this. Voluntary. Yeah, exactly, and that's why the voluntary nature of it is key. A lot of the land use planning discussions that are happening, like if you look at around the capital region, some of these decisions are moving towards a non-voluntary, and that's what I don't want to see happen for our egg producers, where we're telling them we're going to conserve your land and it will, we're not going to consider subdivision or change of use because to me that's not right. But if it's voluntary and you have that commitment with your land and you're willing to make that commitment and you're compensated for it, that's the key because there are people that are doing it now, but they're not being compensated. Like if Slim did it, I'd be like, oh shit, I can't build a house where I wanted to build a house, but I'll build a house on a different piece of land and I'll still farm that land, right? Like well, to be clear, when you grant a conservation easement, it's common, uh, for example, for you to look at a section, say, and say, well, uh, there isn't a house over here in the northeast corner, but that's a logical place one day for someone to have a house. And so you can carve out what's called a building envelope within your conservation easement. Um, you know, they're ve a very flexible instrument. Uh, lots of different things can be done with them. If I remember, I'm just, it was, it was a few years ago, and I'm trying to remember because we, we uh, 
looked at what was going on in the states quite, in, quite intensively, and that was part of the issue down there, that after it had been in place for a while, they found out that they couldn't expand their, their, uh, their program because of the limitations on what they could do with the land. They couldn't expand their buildings. They couldn't expand. There were some issues around that, and I don't know how they ever settled all of that. They were, they were going to review that whole program here a few years ago, and I don't know what ever happened to it. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt that it's a voluntary program. Uh, and there's no doubt it needs to be carefully done. In other words, the landowner needs to be thoughtful. Uh, the landowner needs to be a very public-minded kind of person who says, I want to preserve this food-producing land forever for that purpose. But uh, he or she needs to do it thoughtfully, uh, thinking about the farmstead and how it might need to be expanded and what buildings are needed, uh, etc. So I've been very simplistic in my uh, description here today, but uh, um, the answer is they're permanent, and a landowner doing that has to be aware of that, and all future owners coming along have to make sure, and their lawyers have to make sure that those purchasers are aware that there are limitations applicable to those lands, and that's why those lands are valued less than other lands in the community. Uh, this is just a start. Uh, this is a one mechanism to be used uh, that um, uh, we believe is a useful one prior to, as is alluded here, to the obligatory kind of thing that is being discussed currently in the Edmonton region, where the, the idea is that uh, legislation will be passed uh, creating a, a green belt that uh, is not for development. And now I that, would far rather see us go in this direction yeah. than that direction. That direction is a form of expropriation, isn't it? Sorry about this. Yeah, uh, I read your mind. <laughs> I know you did. I can see it somewhat as a tool if I was to retire and I could uh, put a easement on. I could take the tax receipt and apply it to my sales of other property. Or this property. Or, or this property. So the question is, I got a couple of them. You mentioned selling it to a dentist and he would uh, decrease his tax bracket. Does that work personally too? So if I have a, a $200 bill, I have the tax credit $200, I put it on there. Does that take my tax bracket down correspondingly? Because you'd have to work it backwards, right? You'd, each individual would have to figure out their tax position, but you know, the uh, tax brackets are, there's a certain bracket, and I don't know what they are, but yeah. between $24,000 a year and $47,000 a year, and another tax bracket between 47 and 65, and so there's all these layers of tax brackets, and if you can get yourself into a lower tax bracket by means of a tax receipt, it can make quite a difference. Oh, for sure, I can see that, for sure. Okay, and I agree with you that I think this instrument and we're going to give this a lot of thought in trying to design plans But we think that this might be a, a useful tool as part of an intergenerational uh, change uh, in a farming farming family Okay, so that being said If you were thinking of retiring and doing this and you're retiring next year It would be a good time to do it now but if your plan is to retire in 10 or 15 or 20 years, or it's part of your long range plan, there's no, it'd be detrimental to you to do it now. Because well, there's an increased value maybe in 15 years of what that tax receipt would be. Quite true. Under the ecological gift program, the tax receipt is good for 10 years. And the value increase, uh, say, on the 10 years, and you could be shorting yourself a bigger tax receipt if you waited 10 years, is what I'm saying. That's what uh, you're saying, you can. You can. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, that, that's valid. I, I think what Glenn's trying to say is, does the value of the tax 
receipt go up with the value of land in 10 years? If it, if you keep it ten, the tax receipt 10 years, is it going to be the land 10 years ago? Or is it the land? I think it would transfer to your tax situation on the day you pay it. Yes, yeah. it's, it's a numeric value. But there's going to be an increase. So for me personally, that would be a detriment of entering into an easement until I actually had a need for it. Because I'm thinking I would be shorting myself the potential. That's always the potential. The easement itself is the potential you could sell it for, right? Uh, the to gain a benefit. The value of the gift is determined between the value of the land with the easement as opposed to without. Uh, so there's a differential there. That differential is intended to reflect the degree to which the future development for residential or commercial purposes um, of your land determines the value of your land. Right. That's understood, but in 10 years that difference could be greater. Correct. And that's... And that, that's the problem, and I, I hear uh, of what you say, I think that's a valid comment. And uh, like I said, I, I think this discussion can happen when we have uh, perhaps, a re uh, perhaps a resolution and uh, information a little more in depth on that. But uh, I think uh, we'd be more than welcome, be more than help, happy to allow staff to work with you, Stan, and perhaps set up a resolution both for RMA this fall and uh, ASB next spring. So I, I think if you guys just were to <coughs> work together on that, I think our board would be very happy to look at it. I won't say anything other than that. Do I everybody good with that? Yeah. That of having it RMA in the fall, I would be more comfortable if it was in the spring following the ASB. I'd far sooner have the ASB drive it than the RMA. As if we're going to do it, the RMA, that's the point. You know, the, the ag service part is is more of a minor. Where I understand. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, comments on that? And the, the timing of that would be very useful because uh, I am aware that there is a person in the policy branch of agriculture who has been assigned full time to working on uh, the design of such a program to present to government. Yeah, so, so it could be like the trespassing thing. We'll say, oh, we'll work on a resolution and then a month later, it oh, it's, it's done. There's already something there. So. Which would be good. Which would be good, yeah. I don't uh, have anything against that. But, so maybe we plan for next spring for both. So that gives you a lot of time. But if you guys stay in touch. I'll leave some business cards with this bundle and uh, am always uh, willing to assist in any way as, Thank you. I as don't think required. We need for council because we, everybody's here, so we don't need him to come back. Thank you for coming, Stan, and uh, I'll have somebody move his information. You're welcome. Thank you. I'll move his information. All in favor? Carried. I think uh, adjournment. I'll move. I need one of those copies. Scott has moved adjournment. Thanks for coming, Stan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all in favor? Carried. Thanks. <coughs> We should really book have to the figure Alice out meeting for 11. Or even noon. <laughs>